It's not really an addiction. <laughs> it's just a way of explanation as to where I'm coming from today. So even though I'm a philosopher and not a storyteller, I want to start by telling a story. And this is a story that I tell my children at night. It's one that I think that I like and I get more out of than they do, but I like it anyway, and I thought it would be appropriate for today. So this is a story about a little boy named Joseph. And when Joseph was a baby, his grandfather made him a wonderful blanket. And Joseph had this blanket, and it kept him warm and cozy, and it chased all of his bad dreams away. And as Joseph got older, his wonderful blanket got older. And one day his mother said to him, Joseph, look at your blanket. It's tattered and torn. It's unsightly. It's worn. It's time to throw it out. And Joseph said, no, Grandpa can fix it. So he took the blanket to his grandfather, and his grandfather turned it around and around, and he said, hmm. And his scissors went snip, 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 and his needle flew in and out and in and out. I think there's just enough material here to make you a wonderful jacket. And Joseph wore his wonderful jacket outside to play the very next day. But as Joseph grew older, his wonderful jacket grew older too. And one day his mother said to him, Joseph, look at your jacket. It's shrunken and small. It doesn't fit you at all. It's time to throw it out. No, oh, Joseph said. Grandpa can fix it. So he took his jacket to his grandfather. His grandfather turned it around and around. He said, hmm, as his scissors went snip, 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 and his needle flew in and out and in and out. I think there's just enough material here to make you a wonderful vest. And Joseph wore his wonderful vest to school the very next day. But as Joseph grew older, his wonderful vest grew older too. And one day his mother said to him, Joseph, look at your vest. There's, there's spots of glue and there's paint on it too. It's time to throw it out. And Joseph said, no, Grandpa can fix it. So he took the vest to his grandfather and his grandfather turned it around and around. And he said, hmm, as his scissors went snip, snip, snip and the needle flew in and out and in and out. He said, I think there's just enough material here to make you a wonderful tie. And Joseph wore his wonderful tie to family dinner the very next Friday. But as Joseph grew older, his wonderful tie grew older too. And one day his mother said to him, Joseph, look at your tie. That big stain of soup makes the end of it droop. It's time to throw it out. Joseph said, Mom, stop. It's not time to throw it out. Grandpa can fix it. So he took the tie to his grandfather. His grandfather turned it around and around. Hmm, he said, as his scissors went snip, 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 and that needle went in and out and in and out. I think there's just enough material here to make you a wonderful handkerchief. And Joseph used his wonderful handkerchief to keep his pebble collection safe. But as Joseph grew older, his wonderful handkerchief grew older too. One day his mother said to him, Joseph, look at your handkerchief. It's been used till it's torn. It's tattered and torn. It's time to throw it out. No, Joseph said, it's not time to throw it out. So he took the handkerchief to his grandfather. Hmm, his grandfather said. His scissors went snip, 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 and his needle flew in and out and in and out. I think there's just enough material here to make you a wonderful button. And Joseph wore his wonderful button on his pants to help hold his suspenders up. And one day, Joseph was playing, and his mother said to him, Joseph, where is your button? It's gone. And Joseph panicked. And he looked everywhere, and he couldn't find his button. And he was heartbroken. And he ran to his grandfather, and he said, Grandfather, Grandfather, you have to make me another button. And he said, Joseph, even I can't make something out of nothing. So Joseph went home, and the very next day he went to school, and he sat down to write, hmm, he said as his pencil went scritch scratch on the paper. I think there's just enough material here to make a wonderful story. <laughs> so I tell you this story, and I think this is so powerful because it has a big influence on the way that I think stories relate to our lives. So as a philosopher, what I like to think about is the way that we live experiences and those experiences get turned into our reality. 
As a philosopher of literature and as a philosopher of narrative, what I think about is the way that all kinds of stories create our realities. Our experiences that we have every day don't really mean anything. They're just sort of individual instances. But when we put them together and tell stories about them, we give them meaning, we give them connection, and we create coherence where there probably wasn't any before. So stories transform our experiences, just like they did for Joseph. So as a philosopher of literature, one of the things that I think about is the way in which we construct stories, and we look at stories, and we examine stories, and we analyze stories, and what we do is we can identify stuff. So there's a philosopher whose name is Noel Carroll, and he came up with a list of, of these things that usually are true of most narratives, most stories. And he says there's at least two events. Something happens, and then something else happens. And there's a unified subject, and there's some sort of temporal sequence um, so that you can, even if it's not one thing happened and then the next and then the next, you can figure out what the time sequence is. And then there's some sort of explanatory gap that the reader has to fill in, and the reader makes inferences, what I call narrative inferences, to try to figure out how those things are all connected. So here's an example. The king died, and then the queen died. That's not a story. That's a list. Right? That's what we call a chronology. That's something happened and then something else happened. The king died and then the queen died of grief. Now there's a story, right? Because you have to figure out, why, man, what kind of relationship must they have had for her to die of grief? That's interesting. So we examine stories and we figure out sort of the structures of stories. But what philosophers do is we also think about the way that we ourselves reason. So I think that there are probably two ways that we reason through things. There's probably lots more than that, but I'll talk about two. So the two ways that we reason through things are discursively, like the way that we make um, inferences with inductive and deductive, going from the general to the specific and the specific to the general, the way that we learn syllogisms, the way that we learn math, things like that that are very sort of step by step. And you know how we get from the premise to the conclusion. The other kind of inferences that we make or the other kind of reasoning that we do is called narrative reasoning. And this is the kind of reasoning that's developed through understanding and hearing stories. And this is a very different kind of reasoning through problems. We make the narrative inferences like we do when we fill in those gaps. We fill in the storylines. We're able to follow a storyline and follow a plot. We're able to understand actions and motivations of well-developed characters. And we're able to follow those characters to see how they change based on things that have happened to them. We also have this wonderful element of description in stories that we never have in math um, that, that fills in for us and we can use our imagination in this way. So I like to think about stories and non-stories. Sometimes stories and lists, right? Or stories and math. And the way that I think about this is in terms of narrative or stories and non-narrative. So there's prose and then there's other stuff. And so stories are such a, such a common way that we think through problems that it's, it's, it's built into us, right? So I like to think of this distinction between narrative and non-narrative. Lots of people, when they start talking about stories, instantly go to a different distinction, which is that between um, fiction and non-fiction, which you can see is a totally different kind of split. Right? And so even though those sneetches are fictional, we can learn important lessons about consumerism from them, right? Very true things, right? They teach us all kinds of stuff. All right, so some of you may have heard about what is called the, the new Common Core State Standards. And these are new educational standards that are being implemented um, mostly just this year. They've been adopted by about 45 of the 50 states um, currently. And they're, they're not federal standards, they're state standards where the governors have gotten together and agreed um, that 
they will set certain benchmarks, what they call, benchmarks where all of the states are going to be doing approximately the same kinds of skills at each grade level. So a kid from South Carolina can move to Michigan and he's not going to be a year or two years ahead or behind because they will be doing approximately the same work. Now you may have heard about these state standards and it's somewhat controversial and they've been in the news a good bit recently. South Carolina is currently trying to secede from the common core that they agreed to earlier. <laughs> I just read that the other day. So there, there's, a, there's a big focus on uh, critical thinking, there's a big focus on the STEM uh, disciplines, and hopefully these, these standards are going to be something that allows us to compete more widely um, globally, right? So that's great, but one of the things that they say in their documents is that narrative is inherently less complex than what they call informational texts or instructional texts. I have a problem with that. So what they say is they say fiction and literature will be downplayed because college and career readiness, which they're all about, that's the phrase that you'll find in every sentence, college and career readiness, overwhelmingly focuses on complex texts outside of literature. Now, presumably that's true. Not very many college educations or jobs are going to require you to sit around and analyze fiction. This is true. But what they forgot is this huge aspect of storytelling that exists beyond literature for us. We communicate through stories all the time, right? This is a big way that we communicate with each other all the time through telling stories about ourselves, so what they say is that basically in elementary school, it should be about a 50-50 split between fiction and nonfiction. Above that, then we can move to a, a, um, a less, less fiction because, you know, fiction isn't true. And we want high school students to learn true things, right, not fictional things. And by high school English, now, these are just English classes, not across the board, just in English classes. We should have no more than 30% fiction. And we want to supplement the fiction with true things, right? Now, we've moved from that distinction from narrative, which they started out with in their documents, to the distinction between fiction and nonfiction, which I really hate. So there's an educational literacy specialist whose name is Stephen Krashen. He works at um, UCLA. And what he says is that there are two ways to the path of enlightenment, basically the path of pleasure and the path of pain. He says the, pain, the path of pain is faster, right? Because pain often can help us focus in on what the most important thing in life is. But he says there's only one path uh, with literacy. Only the, the path of pleasure works. So if we have to work to learn to read and we don't enjoy it, we're never going to pick that up. And literacy is something that we develop, right? Literacy, cultural literacy and narrative literacy are things that we develop culturally through stories. And we want it to be pleasurable. But it turns out that they're going to take it out of the schools. So, so what, right? You got to ask the philosopher, so what? What does this mean? Why is this important? Well, reading stories is important, I think. Um, it connects me to others. It connects me to other readers. When you and I have read the same book, we have a real connection. Reading stories allows me to have experiences that I could never have by myself. I can experience what it's like virtually to be another gender, another race, from another time period, to live on another continent. I can experience what it's like to be on the other side of the room when I'm over here, and I could never know what it's like to be over there. Learning to analyze and to love stories makes us better thinkers because of that whole narrative reasoning thing that we have. We don't just have discursive reasoning. We don't only think through math. We reason through stories that we hear and that we tell all the time, and it makes us smarter. 
So stories impact us in three big ways. They impact us morally, they allow for us to develop a real capacity for empathy, they, they impact us socially because they allow us to interact in meaningful ways with other readers in our community of readers, and they impact us cognitively in that narrative reasoning way. And so they make us better, good stories do. So let's go back to our story about Joseph that I started with. Well, stories help us to create something out of nothing, right? But it's not nothing, it's our lives, it's our experiences. And storytelling is a skill that's essential to preparing students, school students, to succeed in an incredibly complex world of really diverse experiences. So the moral of the story about Joseph is that you can always keep your baby blanket even when it's been transformed from, from something physical into something storied. And of course, that you shouldn't let your mother throw out your stuff, <laughs> right? But the moral of my story is that stories are incredibly important to the way that we think about ourselves and the way that we think about our world, and they are equally important to science and math, and they're probably wonderful compliments. Thank you.